Okay. Um, so, Claire, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Vicky. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for, for coming to hear all this today. I will pop this presentation up, which hopefully everybody can see. Um, I think this is probably the last time I'll do the presentation in this current format, because um, as Vicky says, we have got some really um, interesting and exciting findings from the, the piece of work we're doing at the moment with our blueprint. But for now, apologies if anyone's seen, seen this before, there are certainly lots of new elements coming into it as well there. So very briefly, for those who don't know us, we are um, End Furniture Poverty with a campaigning arm of a group of registered charities and social businesses been around for over 30 years. Um, we've got one of the largest furniture reuse charities in the country, Bulky Bobs, and we've also got FRC Living and Booking Interiors, which sell new furniture to, across the social housing sector with 100% of the surpluses reinvested back into the, into the charities. We were created back in 2015 uh, to raise awareness of the issue of furniture poverty and to carry out research and campaign for national solutions. Um, so it helps we've got that resource and expertise of the wider organisation to draw on, but we are very much an independent campaign uh, and we do lots of things. We've got guides to help people to find furniture. We do a lot of uh, work across the different sectors with the grant making sector, the furniture reuse sector, the social housing sector and across local and national government um, and our various reports. I'll talk more about that um, shortly. So first of all, what is furniture poverty? This is our definition. It's the inability to afford or access basic furniture, appliances and furnishings that provide a household with a socially acceptable standard of living. So you may be able to uh, afford it with your income, you may be able to access it through family and friends, or you might be able to access it through a local crisis scheme or a furnished tenancy scheme, etc. If you can't, you can be in furniture poverty and it's very much a sliding scale. So at one end, we have furniture insecurity, people who've got everything they need for now, but if they can't afford to replace it, uh, if, if it needs if breaks or needs replacing, they won't be able to afford to do so, and they can move into furniture poverty. And then there are large numbers of people in furniture destitution. So these are people who have none or very few of the essential furniture items that they need. Typically, this could be somebody fleeing domestic violence, somebody coming from homelessness, uh, or, or simply somebody moving from a furnished to an unfurnished property. Um, and it's a chronic problem, it's not an acute problem. If somebody's lacking an essential furniture item, chances are that's not the only issue that they're facing. But providing them with that item gets them to a stage in their life where they can lift their head and start to tackle other issues as well. So it is vitally important, but it's part of a much bigger picture. And that's why we work with as many partners as we can uh, to develop more comprehensive solutions to furniture poverty. And this is what we believe to be the essential furniture items uh, that everybody should ha have access to. This was drawn up through a consultation with housing and charity professionals. Some items on here are much harder to obtain than others. Uh, flooring is almost impossible to get hold of. Uh, I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, I know a television on there is, is very controversial and it certainly wouldn't uh, very unlikely to be included in a furnished tenancy scheme. But in our broader conversations about furniture poverty, we think a television, particularly if you're elderly, perhaps can't get out much, Certainly during COVID, when we were all stuck indoors, we believe a television is an essential item as contact to the outside world. And it's very expensive to live in furniture poverty. Uh, living without a cooker, relying on microwave meals or takeaways will add over £2,000. These are pre sort of inflation figures, so that will be even higher now. Living without a washing machine, having to use a laundrette is two and a half thousand percent more expensive. Uh, so adding over £1,000 a year to your washing expenses. I can kind of skip this scat slide. We know how bad things are now and how it is getting so much worse. Um, perhaps worth mentioning, the cost of furniture uh, has shot up. So that was just up between 2008 and 2020. It rose by 32%. Uh, with current issues around, obviously, COVID, Brexit, uh, supply chain issues. A lot of the wood for furniture comes from Russia, apparently, um, and, and obviously just general inflation. So those costs are, are going up again. So it's becoming even harder uh, to access essential furniture items for people on low incomes. We have, we, we're just getting the data in now from a, a, a national survey that we've done to examine how many people does this affect? How many people are living in furniture poverty and what do we know about them? We will be, we will hopefully be publishing that before Christmas. Um, but these are the most recent figures available uh, by turn to us, uh, early 2020 data gathered in 2019. So again, pre-pandemic. And it showed there are 
4.8 million people living without at least one essential household appliance, cooker, freezer, fridge, washing machine. So it is a significant problem and one that we do really need to do something about. And it has a big impact on people's lives. It affects your mental health, your physical health, your financial well-being and your social well-being. There's sadly a real stigma attached to furniture poverty. People are, can become very socially isolated when they don't want to invite someone into their home because they're embarrassed because they haven't got a sofa for them to sit on. Uh, people get into unmanageable debt trying to uh, acquire items. So it has an impact on people across their lives. As Vicky mentioned, obviously the Homes, homes for Cathy Commitment 7 is to ensure that properties offered to homeless people should be ready to move into. We believe for a home to be ready to move into, it should be furnished. And that includes window coverings, floor coverings, white goods, bed, sofa, et cetera, all of the essential items that, that we've mentioned. So what are the broad solutions? This is what our, our work focuses on. Obviously we're primarily here to talk about furnished tenancies, but I just want to talk about some of the others very briefly. Um, as I mentioned, one of our charities is Bulky Bobs. Um, so we have a lot of experience around uh, furniture reuse, a lot of expertise. If anyone's interested in discussing furniture reuse further, do, do get in touch and let me know. Um, I would say the quality and quantity of reusable furniture left behind in social housing is usually quite, quite poor and quite low in number, um, but it's certainly something to, to consider. Um, we've also got the world's first mattress cleaning machine here in our Liverpool HQ. We were actually on uh, BBC One yesterday morning on Morning Live. If you want to see a film about, about that, do have a look. Um, we work very closely with the grant making sector. The grant making sector are under tremendous pressure at the moment. I'm a member of the Grant Makers Alliance with the likes of Turn To Us, Family Fund, Bottle, Glass Ball, um, and they're massively struggling. So I think that the, that, that as a route of support to your residents is, is becoming more, more challenging. Um, and uh, we, we do have um, affordable borrowing on that list. It's not something we do much about because we wouldn't recommend going into further debt if you're already at a time of need. But just to very briefly talk a little bit more about local welfare assistance, which, as I'm sure you know, is the crisis schemes run by local authorities. In Scotland, Wales and Northern, Northern Ireland, these are centrally run, relatively well funded. In England, it's a very different picture. It's up to each local authority to decide whether to uh, run a scheme or not. Our most recent report showed there were 32 local authorities in England who closed their schemes. We're currently going through the data from 2021-22. Again, aiming to publish that before Christmas as well. Um, and there are at least a couple more local authorities who have closed their schemes. Um, we, we keep a very close eye on that because there was obviously additional COVID grants. We've now got the Household Support Fund. We're looking at that in depth in this report. We want to make sure that when those, those additional grants drop away, there is still crisis support there. But along with the grant making sector, local crisis schemes are under huge demand. And there's, there's one I spoke to last week, a major local authority with a decently funded crisis scheme who's actually said they're going to stop providing furniture packs to social housing tenants because they believe that the social housing sector should step up and actually support their tenants with furniture and they can no longer afford to do so. And that's something I'm hearing across local authorities. We're talking to a lot of, lot of them at the moment as part of this, this, this current research. And they're saying that, you know, really, they, they've quite frankly had enough of, of doing, of, of shouldering the whole burden. Absolutely not in every case. There are many social landlords who are doing a tremendous job. But I think that, that there's a view that more can be done. So I think that in terms of looking at all the other avenues of support, it's challenging and it's becoming more challenging. One quick fix, one quick win that could be considered is around flooring. Uh, again, this is not every social landlord by any means, but in, in many, it's standard practice to take flooring out when a tenant moves out, in some cases asking the tenant to do, them, do it themselves. In some cases, this flooring is in bad condition, you know, there are issues with it, it needs to go. But in other situations, it can be good quality flooring, which could be left for the incoming tenant. Uh, removal of flooring can mean you lose up to 15% of heat in your property with the energy bills crisis and you know we are in a climate emergency as well that insulating property should not be uh, should not be forgotten it has an impact on your your comfort um, health and safety if you're elderly disabled you've got toddling children and noise issues in flats as well without adequate flooring very few of those support routes I've mentioned provide flooring, very few grant makers provide flooring and very few local welfare schemes provide flooring. So extremely difficult to get hold of. Um, so for starters, if you could please consider cleaning and leaving flooring in place, I think that that's something that, as I say, could be done 
quite quickly and relatively affordably. Yes, it means changing your void practices to a certain extent, but I do believe that it's, it's, it's really worthwhile. Uh, we are involved in a big research project at the moment, looking at flooring funded by Longley Foundation, which is the charitable arm of Stonewater. That's ultimately looking at driving policy change around flooring practices in social housing. Uh, first, we're on the steering group, first meetings next week. Um, so look out for reports, uh, examining flooring in much more detail in the coming months. Uh, and, and it's a three year project, as I say. So do keep an eye out on that. So furnished tenancies. Um, we've done a lot of work looking at furnished tenancies. Uh, we believe that there are some very broad, tangible benefits for the landlord, um, creating those better living conditions for tenants by providing them with a home and not an empty box, particularly mm -hmm. vital for somebody coming mm -hmm. from homelessness, uh, can reduce your turnover. Uh, tenancies can end for a huge variety of reasons. We know that. But having a furnished home can make a huge difference. Um, and those sustained tenancies mean sustained oh, rental income and forward. therefore reduced uh, void costs. Um, they can help to make hard to let properties more attractive. Uh, for some landlords, it's an issue competing with the private rental sector. But those longer tenancies can also help to create more sustainable communities, which can obviously then have a, have a subsequent impact on safety, reduced crime and better living standards. We look into this in much more detail in the, the blueprint uh, report that, that Vicky's mentioned. I'll talk about that shortly. Um, but there's some really clear evidence there around th those benefits. There's one landlord we've spoken to who is now providing furniture. They found that uh, it's created a £1 million saving in their voids budget because they found that the properties, when they return to them, are in a much better condition because tenants are looking after them because they're moving into a home uh, and, and, and some very sort of practical benefits. That will all be in uh, the, the upcoming report. The cost of... Um, uh, furniture is uh, the biggest cause of debt in year one of a new tenancy, which, as I say, has that can have that impact on, on rental arrears um, and that damaging mental, physical, social, financial well-being impact on living without essential furniture items. We know that that sort of crucial support is really important to social landlords. This is what you want to be doing for your tenants. So furnished tenancies is a way to help to achieve that. And there is obviously some obvious benefits to the tenant as well. They're moving into a home. They're more likely to stay in the property. Um, they've got somewhere comfortable to sit, somewhere safe to store their food and to cook it, somewhere to sit and relax, invite family, friends and support workers, helping them with other in other areas of their life uh, into their home. And those tenants on low incomes won't be building up unmanageable debt trying to furnish it themselves. So our first report on this is on our website in a place like home. Um, and it found that only 2% of social rental properties are let as furnished or partly furnished compared to 29% in the private rental sector. From the conversations we've had over the last few weeks with over 30 social landlords, I would say that figure is going to increase, hopefully, su substantially. Lots and lots of social landlords are seriously considering furnished tenancy schemes at the moment, but that's where we were last year. We also wanted to look at what furniture support is currently available and what impact could increased furniture provision have in, on the lives of tenants, but also inversely, what's that current lack of provision? What impact is that having on the lives of tenants? Uh, here were the, the key findings. I'll just whiz through them one by one. So the first finding, furniture provision has a positive impact on tenants' lives. We spoke to many social landlords, those who provide FTEs and those who don't, and we spoke to many tenants to, uh, to draw these findings. Everybody agreed that furniture provision can have a positive impact. Um, also on the reduction of debt and rent arrears and social exclusion, that social exclusion issue as well. We spoke to a couple of tenants who were parents who didn't feel they could invite their children around. They were estranged parents. They were embarrassed because they didn't have furniture in their home. And there was a, a we had evidence again about that reluctance to invite support workers into homes as well. The issue of stigmatization, people feeling judged for their, their lack of furniture. Trying to manage day to day on benefits is hard enough and it is getting so much harder, um, let alone trying to put money aside to pay for furniture and white goods. And it will leave tenants without enough money for, for certainly for fuel, uh, for food and for rent. Um, our research showed that for people on low incomes or relying on benefits, there were few options between crisis grants or furnished tenancies, uh, which don't reduce their disposable income. And that pa inadequate patchwork of options that people are currently going through. Um, this was the support that we found that was currently available. And I've already outlined some of the, the significant challenges with some of these supports. The, the, the grant giving charities 
Uh, often you require a support worker to put in the application for you, which can take up a substantial chunk of staff time supporting tenants with applications. Tenants can be waiting weeks or even months and then find out that they weren't successful. And they're likely to only be able to access one or two items through the majority of these sources of support. Somebody coming from homelessness, likely to be in furniture destitution, will hugely struggle to furnish their home using these sources of support. It was only those in a furnished tenancy uh, who, who were able to access everything that they needed. Majority of tenants don't know where to start to navigate this system. And it was actually this piece of work that led to our finding furniture guides that are on our websites. So if anyone wants to have a look at those and would find them useful, do, do have a look. We've got links to every local welfare scheme in the country on there as well. Um, the barriers, we found there was a, a general lack of awareness and understanding of how a scheme could work, including relevant government policy, um, which led to a, an inch, a, a, a much shorter guide to creating a sustainable furnished tenancy scheme, which is on our website. And now, obviously, the blueprint, which is a much bigger piece of work, which we're doing at the moment. Furniture is absolutely eligible to be covered through the service charge uh, on both housing benefit and universal credit. Um, I, I'll talk more about that shortly. Um, there were obviously the financial pressures uh, uh, facing the sector. We know that there have been significant financial pressures in recent years. But our interviews have shown, and again with a new piece of work, that actually running a furnished tenancy scheme uh, is an income generator, but it does take time. One of the housing providers we spoke to in the last few weeks has actually said they've, just, that they've taken the decision, although the service charge they've set is totally legitimate, uh, because their scheme has been running for such a long time and generates such a surplus, they're taking the decision to actually cut the service charge by 20% uh, entirely voluntarily because they just felt it was the right thing to do. Uh, because the surplus they were making was simply too great, although, of course, it was all reinvested back in to support tenants with furniture. But yes, it can be a, a substantial income generator, but that does take time. Everybody we spoke to has agreed, and again, with the new piece of work, that that top-down support is vital uh, within an organisation to get a scheme off the ground. But there's that real sea change in attitude at the moment. Um, and then the last one, the perceived poverty trap. This is a real issue, but I had a very interesting conversation with Support Solutions yesterday that some of you may know about the uh, validity of gifting furniture to tenants uh, when a furnished tenancy scheme comes to an end for whatever reason. Um, so it absolutely does not have to be a poverty trap. And in fact, for this piece of work, the tenants that we spoke to, the only people who felt it was a poverty trap were social landlords who don't provide furnished tenancies. None of the tenants felt it was. And in fact, they said it was the very opposite. It allowed them to get into a position where they could lift their heads and to start looking at moving into employment. They had somewhere to wash clothes for a job interview. They could get a decent night's sleep. They felt much better about themselves. So the very opposite of a poverty trap. And then the landlords that we'd spoken to who run a furnished tenancy scheme said, not at all, provided you have some flexibility embedded within a, within a scheme to allow tenants to return items to bring the, the cost of that service charge down. And lots of information we'll be able to, to share with you on that. The other thing I think is important to remember, I know that there is this, this you know, fantastic attitude in the social housing sector about supporting tenants and moving them on, moving them on to the next stage of their life whether that's into employment, et cetera. Um, but I do think it's important to recognise that there is a cohort of tenants who are on benefits and are going to remain on benefits. And for those tenants, actually a furnished tenancy is the ideal solution um, of giving them everything they need. And then that peace of mind of knowing that if it breaks or needs replacing, that will happen. And then the last finding, uh, the improvement to tenancy sustainability uh, through furniture provision. And that was very closely related to finding one. And it complements a plethora of research out there that, that, that supports this, this finding. Um, one tenant we spoke to, for people, that's where it all goes wrong. If they've got to get into finance and loans to furnish a place, they can't keep on payments on the rent. Uh, and that's why a lot of people get evicted. One of the landlords we spoke to said, you know, if someone stays in a property for another six months because it was furnished, then you've got an extra six months rent and you save two and a half to three thousand pounds on a possible void or even higher. Organisations need to get away from the concept that it's a financial risk. So we can help you in lots and lots of ways. You know, I do a lot of these talks to, to the large groups, but we very much provide one to one support to help organisations to navigate and to understand what's what's the best route for them, what's the best type of scheme for them. Um, so we are here to help. Um, come back to that in a sec. So this is just some of the some some of the nuts and bolts that, that we've already put together on how to set up a furnished tenancy scheme. 
Organizations are often interested in staff. What are the staffing requirements of a scheme? So we spoke to those who were running schemes to talk about, you know, how, how resource heavy is it? You know, how, how many staff hours does it take? And we found that once the scheme is up and running, um, it's likely to only require one member of staff uh, to do to manage those sort of day to day operations. Um, obviously, you'll need input from from different people to, to put the business case together and get the scheme off the ground. But once you're actually operational, and then anything from 500 to 1600 properties, uh, usually two staff members are typical. Um, and their day to day duties will be liaising with tenants, they need to explain to prospective tenants exactly what a furnished tenancy scheme is and how it works. Make sure they understand that they're not paying off the cost of the furniture, the furniture will remain the property of, of the landlord while the service charge uh, is being paid. Um, it's part of the rent and they need to make sure that the, the, the a furnished tenancy is right for that tenant. They'll need to liaise obviously very closely with other teams such as uh, voids, lettings and allocations, tenancy support team, and also look at asset management and contributing to the, to the report process as well. And asset management is key to the success of a scheme. Uh, first of all, you need the right supplier to meet all of your needs. Usually best to have one supplier who can provide everything that you need. It can make it a lot easier for you. And then they can get to a stage where they can arrange the deliveries um, themselves directly with, with, with the tenant. Um, you need to keep a good asset log to see how many items you've got and where they are uh, to track where replacements may be needed. I know a lot of landlords are worried about items being damaged or stolen if they have a furnished tenancy scheme. But um, again, as part of a new piece of work, we spoke to many, many landlords. That is absolutely not the case. Yes, it happens, but it is extremely rare. It's really not something that should, you should put you off uh, putting a scheme together. Um, regular pat testing of electrical items is not actually a legal requirement, but we do understand post for why you may want to do it. Um, and larger schemes tend to have their own premises to store furniture. Um, if a tenancy ends or a tenant reduces the, the service charge, perhaps if they move to employment, but you only really need that when you have a scheme of a, of a quite a big size and you've been running for a little while, but all things that you need um, to think about. And when you're putting your business case together, um, obviously our new guide I think will be incredibly useful, but different things you need to think about, the financial, the social and sustainability aspects as well. You need to understand the service charge. You need to work out how quickly you're going to want to pay off that capital outlay for the cost of the furniture. If you try to do it too quickly and recoup the cost too quickly, the DWP may not approve your service charge levels. But if you try to do it too slowly, your scheme may not be sustainable. Typically, I would say three years. If you're in an, in an area with much higher rents further down south, you may need to look at five years if you're starting to brush up against the benefit cap. But three years is, is, is fairly standard. Um, you need to think about who you're going to offer a furnished tenancy to, what's your eligibility criteria going to be, and what items do you want to include? And please do refer to our essential items list. And then back to the asset management, do you want to have a regular replacement scheme where you replace items every three years, every five years or whatever, or to do it ad hoc? The majority of schemes, I would say, do it ad hoc, but a handful do look at those regular replacement schemes, which can make it easier to, to, to manage budgets as well. And then what are you going to do with, the with your furniture when, when a tenancy ends? You need to think about monitoring and measuring. You need to prove this, you know, you, you'll need to prove to your board why the scheme is worthwhile and, and how well it's doing. But also to keep those sort of robust measurements can help you look for improvements and way to, way, ways to put a better scheme in place. I've got a lot of information on this if, if you want it. I'm going to whiz through now because I've talked for a long time. Um, and then setting your service charge. Your service charge will need to include the total cost of your furniture. You will need to include a sum for your replacement, repair, void loss costs, etc., and a sum for your management and administration costs. So you should be able to cover the entire cost of your scheme through the service charge. Um, and then uh, obviously you, um, after that, calculate that over three, four or five years, depending upon the time you want to recoup the costs. And this gives you just a, a, a sample of the calculation. Please note that the furniture costs in here are out of date. As I've said, those furniture costs have shot up in recent years, but it just gives you a flavor of, of, of how to put a, uh, a service charge together. This one is worked out over five years. Uh, giving so um, total cost of the furniture uh, over five years and then 50 percent onto that and then another 15 percent onto that there's flexibility um, around those percentages but we would very much say that speak to your benefits office early doors to have that conversation just to, to talk about the calculations and, and how you're putting them together 
There are some fantastic schemes out there already, and we've spoken to many over, over recent weeks. Taurus, we have a case study on Taurus' scheme on our website. Their scheme's been running for, for many years. They've got over five and a half thousand, well, they've created over five and a half thousand over recent years, and they've got about 9% of their 15,000 stock as uh, furnished. Um, they're very honest about the fact that a furnished tenancy will not sustain at every tenancy, um, but they do believe it makes some tenancies last longer. And Ian Fife, who's the FT manager at Tor, is incredibly generous with his time, always happy to be introduced to other fellow housing professionals to talk about their scheme and how it works. And he's very passionate in his belief that this is something that landlords should be doing. This is something they should be doing to support their tenants. Uh, and then Stockport Homes Group, another great example. The only reason Carbon isn't on here is because I know that, that Diane's going to be speaking shortly. They also have an absolutely fantastic scheme. Uh, Stockport Homes Group, there's a case study on their scheme on our, on our website as well. A little different to Taurus's. They only offer it to vulnerable tenants and it's a very flexible scheme. So they, they take their time to speak to tenants, uh, prospective tenants before they move in to find, could they get any items from family and friends? They also have a fantastic furniture recycling scheme as well, where they not only use uh, furniture left behind in voids, but they do a collection service as well across Stockport, not just for, for their own tenants, to give them a good stock of pre-loved furniture. And that's great to gift tenants who might not need a full furnished tenancy. They might just need one or two items that they could take from, from pre-loved uh, gifted. Or it could be that they might have perhaps a flooring or a white goods package uh, through the furnished tenancy, through the service charge, and then take perhaps a sofa, wardrobe, table and chairs gifted just brings that service charge cost down. Um, so again, very flexible. Um, and uh, yeah, so have, have a look at the, uh, the case study on that. So we've, I've sort of teased this a lot, apologies, but we, I am genuinely so excited about this piece of work. We've, we already had a lot of information about furnished tenancies, um, but I was very conscious that we just needed more detail. We needed more robust data and figures uh, and be able to provide more support on um, budgets, on cost and return, uh, measuring performance. There'll be a toolkit in there to, to help landlords. Uh, we've got customer voice in there talking about gifting furniture. Basically, hopefully it will cover every question that you have. And we've spoken to many landlords to say, well, what are your questions that you want answering? And then we've gone away and done our, done our utmost to answer all of them. Um, we've already had conversations with MPs about this, and we've got links into the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities. We believe we have a new minister now, Simon Clark. So um, we've been offered a meeting uh, with his department to go and discuss um, furniture standards in social housing. And I think that, you know, this piece of work will be a uh, will feed into those uh, conversations as well. So everything I've talked about is currently on our website. Um, I am always happy to meet and have conversations and provide whatever support I can. So always feel free to get in touch. Um, and the blueprint I'm hoping will be available in sort of four to six weeks, but we'll be doing webinars and, and sending it out, et cetera. So sign up to our mailing list or just keep an eye on our website. Um, and that's it from me. I hope that was useful. I hope um, it wasn't too repetitive for anyone who's seen one of my other presentations. Um, but uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions. Thank you, Claire. That was brilliant. Um, I think really, really comprehensive overview of what's happening in the sector. Um, and I was really interested to hear that um, because one of the questions I was I was I was interested in, I mean, obviously, we you talked about ad hoc approaches to providing furniture through sort of tenancy sustainment funds, and it's quite concerning to hear of um, local authorities closing their local welfare assistance schemes, and also the fact that the grant making sector is under a lot of pressure. Do you, do you think that it's going to get worse from what you've you know the, the organizations you've spoken to in your research or absolutely i mean we're involved in a number of large sort of anti-poverty groups joseph roundtree foundation and we've got billboards going around westminster today um i think that the um even though we've got the expected freezing of the um fuel cap to two and a half thousand that's still going to be out of reach for many so i think a lot of the support is going to focus on food and fuel 
because of course we've got inflation and the other pressures as well so i think support for furniture and white goods which was already limited is going to become even more limited some of the local authorities i've spoken to um you know we we their budgets have been squeezed for so long and there's absolutely no sign of that being you know that picture getting any better Yes, we've got the household support fund and I've just seen the guidance for the third tranche of the household support fund, which now has to have an element that people come to apply in for support and it can provide white goods. But still, I think support for things like beds, uh, sofas um, and, and white goods themselves, as I say, because it's, you know, we, we all know it, it's grim out there. And I think that while furniture and white goods is obviously what we believe is so important, but food and fuel will take priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think we've got a we've got a couple of questions. Um, I don't know if uh, so. I think hang on. Um, just going back. So I think you've said answered Helen Syrup's um, question about when the research will be published. Um, yes. 80% written so we're carrying on with it so our plan is to publish it in October but as I think I, I've, I've intimated we've got three reports on the go at the moment there's only two of us we're doing our best so the aim is they're all so important so but I'm hoping to get one that one out in sort of four to six weeks time as okay. soon as we can thanks um so Chris Holloway um Chris you've got a question do, do you want to ask it out loud um, that'd be good. Could you introduce yourself as well? Yes, I can do. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Holloway. Um, I'm the head of housing and neighbourhoods for Great Well Homes. <clears throat> um, hello, Claire. I've got um, a quick question. So I understand that the cost of furniture is covered by housing benefit or universal credit. Something that occurred to me while you were speaking is, is does this differ if a customer pays if a customer receives less than 100% of their rent through benefits. So example, if I'm paying the bedroom tax and get 15% less housing benefit, will benefits still cover 100% of the furniture cost, or is it tapered down along with my benefit entitlement? I, you've asked me a question there, Chris, that I don't know the answer to. You However, will I will go and find out. I believe, <clears throat> yes, I believe it will be tapered, but, um, this is the sort of detail that we, we we will be including. So we've had many conversations about um, service charge, many <laughs> conversations about service charge um, over recent weeks. Um, I, I believe it will be tapered, yes, but I will find out the, um, I'll, I'll double check that. And obviously I've got your email address and I'll, I'll drop you an email. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. I was just going to just chip in there, Claire. So it's Diane who. Hi, Diane. Oh, brilliant! Chris. You're here. Yes. Yeah. So it does, Chris. So yeah, it would be depending on the um, the individual circumstances. So we'll come on to talk about our scheme, but we make sure that it's factored into the affordability check. So when the ben welfare, um, when the benefits cap and the bedroom tax came in, that has a small impact on some of the provision and some of the um, eligibility. So it won't always be 100% covered, but. We can put you in touch with somebody in our income department if you want any specific information. Yeah, I, I would really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that other people on the call would would uh, agree that was... We could, know, yeah, out. we could maybe just show an example, but obviously it would be dependent on the service charges that you're charging as well. But yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank no you, Diane. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. And I think it was interesting what you said about, Claire, about actually speaking to your benefits Scheme speaking to your partners, um, reaching out because oh god, it's so vital to have that early conversation. Now I know that in some we're we're, we're trying to get to get a meeting set up with the DWP because I know that in some areas, some housing associations, social landlords have gone to speak to the local benefits office to say right, we're looking at setting up a furnished tenancy scheme, and they get a blanket. Oh well, no, it's not it's not eligible to be covered through the service charge, which is a total load of nonsense. Of course, it's eligible. Otherwise, how how would all these other schemes exist? The legislation, the, the policy is quite clear that it is eligible to be covered, but it talks about a reasonable cost, which is obviously quite vague. Um, but if, if so, what we're hoping to do is to get more um, clear guidance sent out to to every local to every benefits office and universal credit hub, and to look at things like flooring as well to ensure that that you know whoever anyone speaks to, they're told they they understand and know that it is eligible. But you must have those conversations. I was talking to a head of revenues and benefits from a major uh, metropolitan council 
couple of weeks ago and he said basically anything from 20 to 50 pounds a week furniture service charge they would wave through as being completely reasonable sadly that there is some geographical disparity but i think that, that gives you an idea but you, you must have those conversations to to make sure that they're all on side absolutely um well thank you claire um i think there's lots of um positive comments in the chat um which is really great to see um and also um i think there's a few people that would be interested in speaking to you after this yes if, um, if anyone's interested please just drop me an email and we'll get a meeting set up yeah i think your details are on the presentation so obviously yeah. i'll yeah. send that out to everyone after um this um so i think we're just uh as time's marching on, it would be good to uh, hand over to um, our colleagues at Carbon, uh, Diane and Paul, um, talk you through um, their experiences really um, from, a, from a housing association perspective. Um, so uh, if I can hand over to you guys now, that'd be great. That's great, yeah. So hello everyone, we'll just try and get Zoom working. So hopefully you can all see that presentation, yeah. Can you all hear me all right? Any problems? No, I'm not normally the quietest one in the room. So I'm Diane Dakers, I'm the Innovation Manager and my colleague Paul's next to me. We're a little bit distance from the screen. So we just wanted to come and talk to you. Um, we've been on a two and a half year journey. We've historically run furniture and really just to share from the landlord and from the RP perspective, because we've got that historic knowledge and where we've ended up as we've gone through that whole process, which hopefully will benefit some of you today. We're obviously going to touch on some of the areas that Claire's picked up on. We've given you quite a lot of detail, but um, at the end, obviously, there's a chance for questions as well. So really, we looked at furniture in terms of how we build a good quality service. So I don't know if any of you know anything about us. So we're a northeastern Yorkshire organisation. We've got 30,000 homes, so similar to lots of other view on the call, I presume. We were made out of three legacies formed in 2017, and all of those legacies offered different furniture services. And it's fair to say we probably went through the whole range of offers. We've had rent to own, we had recycling, we had the whole 360, and we had traditional furniture rental on a lease model and we ran our own purchase model so a bit like Claire was talking about in terms of the investment in cost of furniture and we really started it was 2019 uh, just early in terms of looking at how we actually um, look at furniture and very much as some of yourselves I'm sure the question at the time after the benefit reform welfare reforms was very much is it a barrier to work? So do our customers still need and do they benefit from furniture provision? And there was a real strength of feeling across the organization. I'm sure some of you on the call have felt that and you've talked to colleagues who experienced that too, that actually it's a great idea to help people, but the last thing we want to do is to put them in a trap where they want to find employment and they're not able to do that, a little bit like Claire alluded to. So it was my job in 2019 to launch the Furnishing Homes project, and this was on the back of some extensive research we'd done in terms of universal credit and the customer journey. Um, and really the aims of that project were to look at where we were, both for our existing customers, and we had about 1600 customers at that time, and our new furniture pack customers, understand was there actually a need, and if there wasn't, we could have walked away at that point, and then really importantly, evaluate the best fit solution. And as I said, we were in a bit more of a unique area because we'd run our own schemes, so we had more control and we'd obviously used significant third parties as well. But really unpick all of that, find the best solution for the customer, looking at affordability and value for money. So I mentioned that we're a northeast um, regional landlord. Obviously, if you're familiar with the northeast, you'll understand that we've got some of the lowest rents within the country. We have high, high areas of indices and multiple deprivation. There's obviously great stuff happening, but there's obviously challenges in a lot of the areas that we work in. So as Claire mentioned, the reason, part of the reason for furniture provision was dri driven off a need. And obviously the northeast was one of the areas where that service worked grew out of initial need and then was proliferated probably way back when there was a high range of items offered we weren't finding when we did our research that there was that consistency of approach obviously we go through several uh, local authorities in our in our geography and um, we find it difficult in terms of grants i think that that need for things as you move in or soon after is really important and we know that's not always possible with grants um, as I said, we've got experience in terms of furniture rental. I think what's really important, and Paul will move on to, is obviously that 
safety and security as well so that quality is great if we can get somebody something but do they understand that they've then got to sort it out if something goes wrong you know will they register that item for a warranty probably unlikely um, and we found and I think not to go through everything but in terms of doorstep loans so I mentioned the universal credit research we knew that legacy benefit claimants had a particular vulnerability and when we cross in, uh, indexed in terms of furniture packs that propensity to doorstep loan was actually higher so we knew that there was that vulnerability and the last thing we wanted to do was to actually make that worse for our customers. And um, we also knew, though, as well, that, that it wasn't the only solution. You know, if, if our customers can afford to purchase their own items outright, it's definitely a more value for money option. A service charge, if you add it up over time, even over 12 months to two years, will not be the most value for money option for a customer who can buy outright or might be able to get a different route to get started. And I think that's really important as well, that you've got that understanding of the different choice elements. So I won't go through the stats because Claire's just so eloquently uh, referenced them, but that's where we were. You know, we looked at where we are, where are the customers? And I think, you know, there's undoubtedly a need and it's not just about that financial cost. You know, we're looking at well-being as we look at our livable standard, as we look at people setting up home as well. Claire mentioned the benefit provision and obviously some of you will be really familiar, but for those who aren't, I thought I'd include it in the presentation. So it's under category D, so it's basic furniture and essential appliances. Um, and it can never be owned. That's unfortunately part of the element of benefit provision. So we actually have a furniture tenancy agreement that our customers sign who take part in the scheme. If they move properties, and Paul will go into the details, but if they move properties, they'd have to bring that, those items back and get a new pack for the new tenancy. Um, and I think what was really important for us, and I mentioned our historical context, you know, we used to offer a significant range of items, which Paul will mention. It was really important we had that core range of essential items, those higher value products. But also we offer customers flexibility. We didn't overly dictate to them. So we went right back to the start. And obviously we had a wealth of existing customers who had joined us at all different points, because I think part of the perception at the start was that this was going to be a short term service benefit for a lot of customers. And when we started looking at it, obviously, we've got benefit eligibility in there. About 80 percent of our customers had some element of benefit eligibility. And um, it it showed that it isn't always a short, short term fix. We do have customers who stay with us for longer, but their needs might change over time. And that communication with customers is important. As I said, if this research had come back and said that customers didn't see the benefit, we would have exited this service. So we would have been in the same place a lot of you have been and some other significant providers have exited the service for various reasons. So undoubtedly, it was a positive message back, probably more positive than we were expecting. So 96% of customers agreed it was a big relief to receive this support. 99% said that it was important to help them get settled into their home and 91% agreed they would have struggled to furnish their homes without it. So very much the language that Claire was using earlier, but we had that evidence from our customer base. We also um, researched with our colleagues as well to make sure there was still that perception of support, which items, which customer base. And I think the other thing that's really important for a rental service is the repair and replacement aspect of the service. They were really highly valued and that links back to Claire's furniture insecurity that she mentioned earlier. So we looked at the fact that there was work to do though. It wasn't all roses, obviously. Um, and we knew this because we joined three organizations into one. We knew we had some challenges to overcome. So there was definitely a lack of clarity for customers. People move in and they get a lot of information. So they'll accept that they're getting the sign up, they'll get information on where to ring in a repair, that you don't own it, et cetera. And then two years down the line, they've forgotten. So we found that customers just didn't have that clarity of how do you actually report the repairs? People were scared to tell us if an item was broken. You know, they worried that they get charged. So a customer might go and buy their own, which is not where we want to be. So what they were actually paying for, so that visibility of information for them and for us was really important that they were unable to own the items. If some of the research feedback was, well, I've been paying for it for three years, so I must own it by now. So we needed to make that message really clear and just the fundamentals of how to return. And that's really important because that impacts on our void process as well. So that could be loss of, of pack 
and that's covered in a recharge process with our furniture tenancy. But also, we're now in a purchase model, which Paul will explain. We don't want to lose those items if there's an inherent value in those items, whether it's social or other as well. So what was really important was customer experience and engagement. They were both priority. Obviously, we've got part of our strategic aim is to deliver excellent customer service, and we measure that. And we knew that some customers would like to progress to ownership. So we haven't, we strategically decided not to be in that um, area anymore. We were historically, but we wanted to make sure that we had regular reviews so a customer realizes that they could exit the service and they could go and acquire their own if that was possible and they can return them at any time. So with that in mind, I'll hand over to Paul. He'll give you a bit more detail on the service. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Morning, everybody. Uh, Thanks for joining us. As Diane alluded to, we, we after extensive research, decided to launch uh, our own furniture rental scheme, which is a purchase model. And uh, we purchase all the items and then rent them directly to our customers. And we brand it the Home Comforts Rental Service, which is a, is a common uh, internal brand name. So the, the, the way that it operates is that um, it's charged as a weekly additional charge to the rent account and a, a separate furniture tenancy. As Diane said, it's, it's eligible for universal credit housing benefit. One of the advantages that we do offer our tenants is that when we install appliances, uh, we do it professionally through uh, qualified electricians. We deliver, unpack, remove all of the debris furniture. We do the install. We run through a process of how the, um, the appliance operates, works, what the general maintenance items are. Also, we leave the details of how to report any faults, et cetera. And we actually register the appliances um, through the manufacturer's warranty. So we hold the warranties for those items um, and replace them as and when they break down. But uh, the customers are able to return items at any point should their uh, circumstances change. It's, there's no penalty clause, minimum period, anything like that. We, uh, we commit to repair or replace any items which aren't working at any point in time. And we able to do that within 24 hours. Uh, items are rented and never owned, and that's the DWP rules, uh, unfortunately, which uh, are explained to our tenants at the outset. And we made a decision that we would replace appliances every four years. And um, that's partly to do with the um, HSE guidance around PAT testing. So the first two years will be covered by the manufacturer's warranty, years three and four. And the HSE guidance on PAT testing is that every four years an appliance should be PAT tested. Um, we try to do it every two years. Um, that's our kind of standard policy. But uh, as Claire mentioned before, currently there's no legal requirement, although I understand that they are looking to uh, implement PAT testing uh, as, on a regulatory basis. So the, the three, um, <coughs> excuse me, three packs that we offer to our customers is the Home Comforts Startup Pack, which is up to 20 points. And uh, realistically, uh, comes to a single item. Um, so that could be an electric cooker, a washing machine, fridge freezer, under counter fridge, condenser dryer, single bed and mattress or a double bed and mattress. We then move up to the 60 points home essentials, which uh, is designed for those in, in greater need or a slightly larger family. And again, that will allow them to uh, acquire three or four items potentially, of, of, depending on their circumstances and what's required. And then the final pack is the Home Essentials plus up to 110 points. And that's designed for the larger family and offers additional items, things like bunk beds and microwave ovens for those who can't cook. Although microwaves can be offered across any of the three packs, depending on personal circumstances. And we found that those three um, core service elements cover most of our tenants' needs. Uh, and that's based on the research that we carried out. Let's get the next slide, please. One of the important things we, we discovered from the, the previous services that we did and through the, the innovation work that Diana and colleagues did was that there was a lot of uncertainty around the service and skepticism and the difficulties about understanding it. So one of the, the things that we work very hard on is to design a customer journey roadmap, which try to break down the schemes into, into individual steps to make it easy for everybody to understand. So the first part would be discussing the needs and that's relying on our housing colleagues and our customer service colleagues at the front line who are doing tenancy lettings, talking to the, the customers about 
what's important to them, what they need to, to make them sell into a property quickly, to make them stay longer. Um, we also engage with our Money Matters teams uh, to look at affordability checks. Um, we talk about the alternative options. We appreciate that the, the furniture rental scheme will not be for everybody. Um, we're quite open and honest about what it means. You know, they can't ever own the, the items because of the data with pay rules. Um, we also talk about the, the possibility of getting gifted furniture from friends and families and colleagues, the alternative uses, can they afford that before they actually sign up to the scheme? And then we explain what signing up to the scheme actually means. No minimum term, flexibility. They have the guarantee that if something breaks down, uh, it can be returned, can be repaired or replaced. There's no charge on that. Although within the tenancy agreement, we do have a, a clawback provision for uh, excessive claims uh, through neglect or misuse. So we do we do point that out to tenants that you know it's it's a service that we provide, but there is a responsibility on their behalf to engage with us on a regular basis to make sure that uh, the items are being used correctly and maintained. Then we move to the sign up stage. Um, there's a separate furniture tenancy agreement that they have to sign up to, which sets out very clearly um, the, the responsibilities, the reasons why they can't own the furniture and what the steps they need to do to repair, replace or return items and how that will in, impact on, on the charges that we levy against each of the bands. Then there's the delivery install expectation. So once they've signed up the tenancy agreement and the order has been placed, we have a commitment to supply the appliances within seven working days. In reality, we're managing to hit five working days currently, um, but it's something that we constantly revisit and monitor. Um, within that, as I mentioned before, we deliver the items, put them into the place or the room that the customer requests. We unpack the items, take away all of the debris, carry out the instructions, etc. One of the reasons for unpacking is to ensure that the uh, items don't get sold on, which uh, we have seen uh, in the past, uh, tends to try to do that. Um, but obviously, if, if the customer services uh, and housing staff do their job, uh, as we hope they would, we try, we, you know, we actually are only offering the tenancy to people who actually need it and therefore are less likely to sell it on. We do the uh, internal connection through our property services team to ensure that it's compliant, uh, it meets our safety standards, and it is safe for the clients to use. That was one of the criteria that we were very, very clear on. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to offer the service was to have greater control over the items that we offered. The safety for the tenants was a priority, uh, and also for the properties and the consequential effect that that might have, both on our properties and on the residents. And also to, um, ensure that we were working with a, a reputable supply chain to ensure that we were getting the most uh, efficient uh, performing appliances because of the cost of running these uh, appliances can be significant and, uh, and a concern to, to, to customers um, that they were of decent quality and we made the commitment because of the part testing which I alluded to earlier that they would replace every four years so we based our model on a four-year replacement and depreciate the items accordingly and once the tenant has um, joined the service and received the goods, we uh, follow up with a, a welcome letter, again, reiterating the, uh, the requirements of the service tenancy and uh, giving details of maintenance issues and how to return or any concerns, contact details. And that letter goes out within three or four days of the uh, appliance being received. We then have a settling in period where after a month, uh, one of the uh, home comforts team will ring the customer just to make sure that the appliances that have received are working as they should. They are as they expected and they are actually required and can be afforded. Um, it gives the, the, the tenants uh, the opportunity to raise any concerns, flout any issues that they may have. But it's also an important way for us as a, as a housing association to maintain that contact with customers and make sure that, you know, we're actually reaching the, the part and addressing the welfare issues that they have. On from that, uh, we have the one year on follow up call um, carried out either face to face with a housing officer or through one of the home comforts team. We'll make contact with the customer again, just making sure that everything's working as it should be, that the service is still required, that they, uh, they have no change of circumstances which may impact on their affordability and their ability to pay. 
if there are any issues, you know, we, we follow up with a, a face-to-face visit and involve our Money Matters teams again to look at their changing circumstances. Then again, after the second year, we do a, a visit, a visual inspection of the items just to make sure everything's okay, pack test where we need to. And then on the full year, we do the, the replacement. If a customer wants to retain um, sofas or beds, etc., because they're in good condition and they're comfortable with them, we do allow that but we do insist on any electrical appliances that they are changed, and that's to make sure that they comply with the PAT testing requirements. So as and when their customers can change items, if they are no longer working, you know, we'll happily replace them with new. Uh, we'll, we'll bring them back. We'll talk a little bit about the, the recycling process in, in a second. If they're no longer needed, uh, we'll have the conversation with them and see if we can reduce the costs of the packs, whether it can move it down a pack size, and it may well be that you know one item in it alone would not reduce that um, transition back down to the reduced cost and excise. So we'll talk about what other things they can do to reduce that. So, for example, by returning a, a set of drawers or replacing a set of drawers with a second-hand set that we can point them to through one of our um, reuse recycle centres might reduce that. So we're always looking to try and reduce the costs. If they move on to another property, uh, either within carbon, or with another private landlord or, or social housing provider. As Diane said, we do end that furniture tenancy uh, and we'll grant them a new furniture tenancy in the new property. And that's so that we can track the asset and give the customer a guarantee that, you know, in transit, there's been no damage to the appliances and that the new appliances they get will be new and they will be installed safely and correctly and that the circumstances still match the requirements. Any change in circumstances, so somebody was to, to gain employment, for example, um, we have the option to have the conversation with us about whether they still want to retain the service. Um, because obviously you, you, can, you can start work and the benefits will stop virtually straight away, but it then can push you into the trap of having to then purchase equipment to replace it. So we do have a transition period where we work with people to try and, if necessary, take that tenancy through and ease them into that progression. So then as part of that process, we developed the Home Comforts Toolkit. So the toolkit was designed to give the most up-to-date and current information and guide customers through the process to make sure that it was fully transparent, they understood it. So it starts off with a customer information leaflet about the service, what they can expect from it. Um, we give them the colleague guide and the customer journey map. So it tells our internal staff what, how we should be offering the furniture, what it's there to achieve, the differences between the packs, um, the affordability checks that they must do to ensure that it's the right service for the customer. It's not about carbon making money, it's about supplying the need. That, that was very clear in our aims and objectives. And then the customer journey map is as we just showed you, uh, which tells the customers the various stages, what they can expect and how to, to do exchanges, etc. We also have a new internet page um, which people can see the items uh, as they are. And we have a, pay, a page on our website where the customers can actually log in and either identify the items that would be most suitable for them, uh, look at the costs incurred, et cetera, and then make a decision based on the information available. We also looked at the, the full scheme and, and what would mean when we have retur uh, furniture returned. Um, and this was quite a challenging uh, decision for us. Um, we use a reuse network uh, in local areas. So we will um, donate return furniture to uh, one of our um, charitable partners who will then offer a service out. And we also use a grant search tool to find alternative ways for customers to access furniture items. As I said, we, we accept from the start that the furniture rental service that we offer will not be a fit for purpose for everybody, um, but it's there to, to help the, the most vulnerable. <clears throat> so the journey again, just to reiterate, after customers discuss their needs with the housing officer and do an affordability assessment with them, we get an understanding of what items will make the most impact to them, and uh, what, what will be eligible for service charge, uh, sorry, eligible for benefits, and how that will impact on the service charge. We explain what they need to do if the circumstances change or they can no longer afford the items or the items break or are no longer required. 
Once the affordability has been established in the tenant conference that they wish to proceed, the customer enters into a formal tenancy agreement, which sits alongside the furniture order and the housing tenancy. And when the tenancy agreement has been completed and accepted, our finance team activate the service charge record and arrange collection of a weekly rental charge, manage the income account and correspond with the tenant regarding annual reviews or changes in circumstances, adjusting as necessary when circumstances change. I think the important thing with, with that is to say that we also use it as a, as a, a way of engaging with our customers and identifying where circumstances change and people have a, a welfare need beyond the uh, furniture requirement. So one of the lessons that, that we learned uh, when setting this up, uh, the most important considerations we, we believed in our experience were consider what the customers actually need, be clear on the objections of the organization, what we want to offer. In the past, we'd offered a full range of services, everything from tea towels, cutlery packs, etc. But on reflection and review, we found that people were paying a lot of money for a service or service over a long period of time, which could be better afforded. You know, they could go to home bargains and places like that and buy cutlery and tea towels for a fraction of the, what they would be paying over the rental period. So we decided to the, the most beneficial way for us would be to strip away some of the smaller items that were deemed affordable or could be sourced from alternative routes more easily and focus on the major appliances and major pieces of furniture, which would potentially push residents into uh, poverty otherwise. The other consideration was what alternatives are available and the cost con consequences of those alternatives. You know, brighter kind of places like that who were offering high interest rates on the high street were more than likely to push customers into poverty than, than to benefit them. But also equally, there were charities and secondhand retailers who could provide some of those items that we decided we, we weren't going to offer. So it's, it's a bit of signposting between that as well. As an organization, uh, we had to consider the capital investment required, the depreciation rate of items and the rental returns so that the service was sustainable for us. Social heart but business head was very much our tagline. You know, we had to find a balance point for us. And as Claire alluded to before, there are a lot of considerations depending on your own organization structure, et cetera, and how you want to fund these. We were very fortunate that we had a very supportive board who recognized the need and were prepared to make money available to uh, allow us to, to operate a purchase model. And then design. Design the service which best suits your customers' needs and have a greater control over how that, that service pans out. For, our, for carbon, our priorities were ensuring the safety of our customers and properties by ensuring we offer quality items that are regularly maintained, replace at appropriate service intervals, and minimize the risk. To ensure our most vulnerable tenants were able to access affordable, good quality items that would allow them to enjoy a reasonable quality of life without the fear of exploitation, and design the service that met our tenants' needs and expectations, but was also sustainable for us as a business. Yeah, thanks. I'll hand over to, uh, to Diane again, who'll talk about the, the full 360 model. So I think I'm just, I've got one eye on the chat and I think the questions come in about the, what happens after four years. So as Paul said, our model and our basis at the moment is new items on a four year return model. Over time that might evolve with right to repair legislation. And, you know, if we could work, have a working model that would allow us to leave items in there, that would be brilliant but we've been down that journey of service and quality and challenges. So that's why we're at that model. What we are working on though, and just to make clear as well, so we actually have a, a partner that delivers the service with us as part of Home Comforts that went through an open tender process and it's actually FRC because they secured it on the open tender in terms of best fit. So we're working on delivering a 360 model. So working with themselves. So we do have items that come back before four years that will still have life in those items. We don't send them back out into the service, obviously, as I've mentioned, for various reasons. But we're looking at trying to generate social value and leverage off those items in some way for carbon customers. So we're doing some work with some reuse recycle partners in the Northeast as an innovation test to see if we could actually get those items back out to generate social value, but also if we can then leverage, and I know some examples have happened before in London and places where, could there be a further discount for carbon customers who 
purchase or have a need so you know could those extra items they need be sourced so it's very much in its infancy in terms of that social value credits but that's really what we want to do obviously we don't want we want a minimization of landfill we want to make sure that people have got good quality items and we are obviously want to demonstrate the social value of the scheme and if there's an add-on that can actually demonstrate further value that's great and then just to round up, because I know there's a few questions in really, is Florin, and Claire's um, aware, as Vicky is, that we've been on a journey with Florin as a lot of other housing associations are, and we're probably behind some of our peers, um, but we're looking at Florin. We've, we started in 2020 looking at a challenge right in the middle of lockdown in terms of how we could help our customers source and afford Florin so they could set up home. And the first idea of a Florin service is something we're still looking at. So we've done small scale tests, We've got great qualitative feedback in terms of financial and well-being benefit, but we're really looking at, at scaling up to a small, you know, a relatively small scale still, but looking at those metrics, looking at can we leave more flooring down in our void properties? We've done the figures and we're leaving quite a low percentage for various for various reasons. Not that we don't anecdotally want to leave it, but there's lots of complexity around that. Um, but also looking at is carpet the only solution or are there different flooring solutions? And we're really looking at the measures and we've been helped by 13 and citizens sharing some of their learnings. I know Claire's on from Citizen today in terms of their fresh start, but we're looking around customer satisfaction, lettability, sustainment of tenancy and void impact in the longer term, that virtuous circle, which would be brilliant if we got there. And we hope that in the next stage of our test, we'll be able to establish the metrics and really understand in two different areas of our locality, whether those can make a difference. And we hope to be able to share more as we move forward. But obviously, we're looking at the sector and the long lead research and just really looking at our peers in terms of how they've approached it, which I think we're all going for the same problems. So that's us. So we've put our contact details on the presentation. And obviously, we, we know, because I spent two and a half years looking at it, and it hurts my head still, that furniture rental is not an easy solution there's loads of different routes you know we started on a scheme we used to offer 240 points to our customers we're now on a lean customer focused up to 110 points so hopefully from that you can see that we've been on a journey and we understand that there's challenges internally in terms of service charge barriers to employment so we're happy to answer questions today but if there's something specifically from a housing association perspective that you'd like to talk about offline then we're happy to share our time and our learnings i will get that example of i'll ask rob who's our head of income who's a master of housing benefit maybe if we just give you an example on a 10 pound service charge of of how it could be affected by bedroom tax so i'll get a little bit of information on there but i don't know if we want to dive into the questions vicky i'll hand back over to vicky Thanks, Diane. Thanks, um, Paul. That was really um, insightful, um, e excellent um, overview of what, you, what you're doing. I think a few things stood out to me. Um, the fact that you highlight alternative routes to, to customers. Um, how does that work with your... So housing officers go through the whole process. Have they had to have training and I mean, obviously, it's a sort of more of a specialism alternative for it's perhaps more of a specialism for a tenancy sustainment officer. So have they yeah. more been, been trained more in tenancy sustainment to be able to sort of I think that? we've, you know, as a lot of housing associations, we've got some really good long standing housing officers. So we were three legacies and we've got a massive locality, as a lot of people on the call have. So there's not, unfortunately, so there's the reuse network but there's not one. So we have people like Orange Box that we're working with on the innovation test who will cover more of the region. But if you're familiar with our region, you know it's completely dispersed and there's a lot of miles to cover. So I think it's those housing officers being empowered. So it's our homes lettings coordinator. So they do the first part of the process. And after two weeks, it goes to, send to tenancy sustainment. They need to know what's available. And it's really understanding that customer. They know that that customer is going to have a weekly charge that may be benefit eligible. Um, if there's an in your face alternative that's easy and they know that customer is going to change circumstances, then they we're trying to give them the tools for local knowledge, whether that's literature or website based with grant network. And the more that we can get our housing officers familiar with their locality, the better. I think generally that's something that we always did. It's just giving them that permission to say that's still, you know, this isn't the best value for money route for a lot of customers in the long term. If they could own, they that's the best way if they can acquire that's a great but they've got to acquire from a reputable route and I think you know 
we'd rather a customer took a furniture rental service for a period of time than bought or acquired a second-hand appliance that had never been checked. So I think that's the that's the the conundrum really, isn't it? You know, when we get into white goods, you get into significant risk. We've purposely moved away from small electrical in our scheme because of the PAT testing implications. And that doesn't make customers happy, but the value for money of a Hoover over time is not there, but also the risk of that appliance is potentially greater. So, you know, we've chosen our way. It may not be right for everyone, but if somebody wants to have a conversation, we can share why we've done the things we've done. Mm -hmm. I think the further enhance the answer uh, in the way that we engage with our housing colleagues and frontline customer services staff is um, we visit and we go around the offices uh, monthly uh, with my, my small team in, in home comforts. So we're, we're very in tune with the feedback that they're getting from their customers. And we're very keen to reiterate the alternative routes that are there for people. So rather than a housing officer or a customer service advisor just saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're not eligible or, you know, I can give you this, but it's not really fit for purpose for you. We do encourage them to, to, to say there. Look at the, all of the alternatives before you make the decision to jump into the service. And I think the other point on that, so just to finish off, we've chosen because it suits our model that we've got a separate team, but that's also something that's beneficial. So we have some resource. So obviously you mentioned the admin charge, Claire. So that admin charge allows you to claim back for the the true administrative cost. So some of that is in our service charge team. So that accuracy of charges going on, making sure that things are ended right is really important for the service. But also that discrete home comforts team, because the housing teams are so busy, they have to understand the service and they have to understand the customers. But having that champion of the service, which we lost when we moved into legacy, I think we found is really important and other people might benefit from. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and it's great to see, you know, you've got you've you've got a process, it's well defined points of engagement with with customers when and, and how, um, which is clearly really important. Um, and also, obviously, the comms around it as well, I think, um, which is, you know, clear to see from your toolkit. Yeah, um, you've obviously done a lot of work. Um, yeah, and we've done it right. because we've solved problems as well, you know, that awareness mm -hmm. for colleagues. So different legacies, customers forgetting, colleagues who don't generally interact with the service not being aware. The customer touch points are in there, one, to make sure there's safety and quality, two, to make sure that customers don't leave that communication. Like I say, somebody would be scared and would buy their own, and that's not something that anybody who runs a furniture service wants to get to. So we've been there, and we know that the, you know we're doing an extensive programme of work with our existing customers with our older items, you know, to make sure that we do that four year cycle and we get, we've got that up to date cycle on there. And that takes a lot of work, mm. but it's a service that in our model obviously makes sense from the social perspective, but we've, we've structured it. So there's a benefit to carbon as well in terms of reinvestable surplus, hopefully at some point. Mm. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I'm just checking if there's any, okay, our, our long question. Um, from Zoe Titchener. Um, so do you want to ask it or shall I? <laughs> Who, you can unmute yourself if you, if it's- Yes, Candy, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I thought I'd better put at the start, this is a question, not just a <laughs> ramble. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue about flooring, it's, it's really good to hear it recognised. Um, I think the, the furnishing schemes sound really, really great for furniture and white goods and, and those kind of essentials, but flooring um, sort of being based at a citizen's advice, it's something that nationally we've had just from all over the country. As soon as you mention it, you suddenly get, oh, we'd like to do something about that. Yeah, we see this problem um, for, the, for the cost issue, primarily for, for clients, moving in. Um, so yeah, just wondering whether, um, I guess, for, for Homes for Cathy and then Furniture Poverty or the, the rest of the panel, really, whether that's something that you think we should raise sort of one by one with each registered provider? Is it something that each social landlord, obviously you have your own policies that you set, is it something that we should kind of approach on that one-to-one -one basis? Or do you think there's an appetite or a potential route to look at it on a sort of national level? Quite a big question, but thought I'd, thought I'd ask. Claire, have you got any thoughts on that? Having, yeah. So obviously we are we we. Um, and my approach is always do both. I think that because there's there's no one answer. You know, different organisations will work in different ways. So I will always do things like Homes for Cathy, NatFed, CIH, 
but also pursue those one-to-one -one conversations with organizations as well because I think both approaches are, are beneficial I would say if resources are tight I would I, I think your best bet is is, is the one-to-one -one conversations because I think it's I think there are some things that landlords do that they know they shouldn't do, but they just do it because that's how they've always done it. And I, um, my approach is to is to really un unpick all of those layers and strip it back and then make it clear, look, this is really bad practice. Is there a better way of doing it? And of course, I think, as, as Diane said, there are some there were some situations and some cases where it's absolutely right that flooring is removed but there are a lot where it doesn't have to happen. Um, so I would say from a national citizens advice perspective, I would, you know, every, all the organisations get into their local landlords, ideally from a policy team perspective, just look at having those national conversations. Hopefully that's what this work with the Longleaf Foundation is going to do as well, but we can never have too many voices, I would say, on this. But from, from your perspective, I, I'd go and knock on the door. Thank you. I think I was going to add, I think there's associations that are quietly doing good things that may not, you, you know, it may be hard to dig yeah. it out, but they are, there is great work going on, but they, they might not be shouting it from the rooftops necessarily. Um, I think my own association might be victim, you know, guilty of that. Um, so, yeah, um, a one to one. I think, I think then yeah. if, if you can highlight that good practice, Vicky, and, and show off that this organisation is doing a great thing, it can twist arms with some of the other organizations yeah, yeah. Sort of to show that because yeah. you're absolutely right there are some fantastic things going on and it, it's finding out about it and then you're able to say oh well actually you know so and so in the neighboring authority is doing this sometimes it's inspiring them and encouraging them and other times it's like highlighting actually you know you could do a bit more mm. do we have any other questions does anyone want to put their hand up and be brave <laughs> you don't no no pressure um, I was thinking in terms of um, carbon scheme, actually, how how does it do you still have sort of your tenancy sustainment team and do they sort of now have their priorities changed since I mean, obviously, you've always had the furniture scheme, so that might not be relevant, but I just wondered, d does it allow them to sort of concentrate on other things and concentrate on perhaps more sort of complex needs um, tenants? So I think. The furniture rental service has always had a value. I think we've never traditionally offered it to existing customers because obviously a lot of the issues are about the benefit eligibility. So there's been that fear. Uh, we've shifted slightly position on that where if somebody comes and has a change of circumstances, so, you know, they used to have great appliances and they've broken down, you know, uh, a bed's broken, there's children not sleeping in beds, then we'll offer that. I think the busyness of our tenancy sustainment and challenge, as I mentioned, I think having that champion element, but just knowing if we make it easier for colleagues, we'll make it easier for customers. So I think that's that's our, if our sage advice, if you can call it sage, is just make it as clear as possible for your colleagues who are busy, who are constantly out and about with seeing a different customer base, anything we can do. So you know, whether it's DocuSign for our tenancy, for our French tenancy, you know, we've done a lot of work in terms of visibility. So Paul mentioned the intranet page. So uh, for the new homes, our housing team have got more accessibility in terms of what's happening. So when is it due? Because obviously charges go on at the start of tenancy and we've got that five day to seven day window to deliver. So just really simple things. What are the frustrations? And any time we can give back to housing frontline colleagues is obviously time that will be well spent. Does that answer? I think so. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Um, I think there might be one comment oh from melanie king from sanctuary um we're just about to go national with our welcome home project fantastic to hear um we offer tenants who come to us with nothing a voucher from argos ranging from five four hundred to five hundred and fifty pounds depending on household markup makeup tenants are able to pick what they want and are able to keep the items so if they leave us they can take the items with them we have funded this through our supply chain partners which is another way to look at funding so it's excellent obviously there are different ways to approach this um you know and and uh perhaps if you yeah i was going to say i'd say on that as well we did some work looking at setting up of the more minor items so before the 
inflationary pressures about 150 pounds to get so that was everything from bedding to spoons you know on a an asda voucher so i think that's brilliant that you're doing that melanie and that would allow that flexibility of you know and what we've tried to do with our schemes as well is allow that flexibility so you can have a single item of something but you just can't uh, Paul mentioned the single item pack, which is very affordable in terms of service charge. And obviously we don't really want to, you know, it's an, it's an hour situation, but we've purposely put in a single item pack to give that flexibility. Mm. Um, but apart from that, you know, if actually that single item is a microwave, who are we to say that that's not the most important item for our customer, but we'll try and encourage them into value for money. Mm. But that's brilliant, Melanie. Excellent. OK, well, um, we're approaching half 12, so we'll wrap up. I think um, I think that some people might need to, to dash off. So um, thanks to um, Claire and Diane and Paul for your excellent um, uh, presentations. I think everyone's found that really useful and probably will want to continue these conversations offline. So hopefully that will happen.